Good morning, everyone. My name is Phil Cates, and I'm an extension educator based in Nathumma, Michigan. And uh, today for our virtual breakfast, we're certainly glad to have you join us and be part of it, part of this weekly event that we have. There are a few things I want to share just as we get started this morning. And the first thing I want to talk about is if you have not muted yourself, would you please do that during the, during the presentations? Uh, background noise is very difficult for our presenters and for those that are on the call to hear. So please mute yourself uh, during the time that you we're here. Everyone will have an opportunity to ask questions a little bit later on. We'll have a 30 minute question and answer period following our presentations today. But in addition to muting yourself, I'd like you to sign in with your first and last name, if you could. And if you go to the participant list at the bottom of your screen or wherever that black bar is, hover, click on that and hover over your name and then right click and then rename yourself so that your names come up. And that'll help us to know who's asking questions or who's on the call. And again, the chat box is where we're going to have our questions for today. And we hope that you will be able to take advantage of that. We'll have many of our specialists on this morning that will be able to answer any type of call, whether it's a soil fertility possibly or weeds, but uh, we are glad that you're here. And RUP and CCA codes will be given at approximately 7.30. It depends on how many questions we have concerning the weather this morning or how long Jeff talks about the, the rain in, as we heard a little bit earlier. The collection of demographic data from program participants, it's very important and it actually is a mandated aspect for all of our programming with MSU Extension. It's voluntary and the information you provide is not used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participates in the program for today. A link has been shared in the chat. I'd like you to ask you to take a minute to fill out the information, and I say thank you in advance for that. So without any more from me, I'm going to introduce Daniel Bublitz, and he is going to talk about rhizoctonia management and sugar beets. Daniel is our sugar beet specialist and has been with Extension several years now and has really uh, been doing a great job. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and bring Daniel in. So Daniel, if you can share your screen, that would be terrific. Well, thank you, Phil, for that wonderful introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for the virtual breakfast series today. My name is Daniel Buplitz. I'm the Director of Sugar Beet Advancement and the MSU Sugar Beet Extension Specialist. And today I'll, I will be talking about rhizoctonia management in sugar beets. So rhizoctonia root and crown rot is a very serious uh, soil-borne disease of sugar beets. It's caused by the fungus Rhizoctonia solani AG2-2. This is a worldwide problem for sugar beet production. There's some fairly uh, heavy infection areas here in the United States, as well as in Europe and in Japan. And so this is the most uh, severe soil-borne disease of sugar beets in Michigan, and it impacts at least 50% of our acreage. And so depending on when and where on the sugar beet uh, the infection occurs, this disease can appear in three different forms on our sugar beets, including as a seedling disease, as a crown rot, and as root rot. So for the seedling disease, the infection will begin beneath the soil line, generally towards the root tip, and it'll start there and then spread up towards the hypocotyl, which is really very different from one of our other major uh, seedling diseases called the phanomyces, because the phanomyces will start at the hypocotyl. And so then for the rhizoctonia seedling disease, it will eventually cause a wilting of the sugar beet, and then after a while, a damping off. And so the damping off can occur either before or after emergence. And in fact, you can uh, often see in a very heavily infected field, even up to like the six or eight leaf stage, the beets kind of like pinch off the soil line, like you see in the pictures here, and eventually get blown away even by the wind. So another form of this disease is crown rot. And crown rot, rot will often begin when soil containing hyphae of rhizoctonia lands in the crown of the sugar beet and infection actually takes place in the crown. And so what you'll see is a blackening of the petioles and the crown of the sugar beet. 
and eventually the rhizotony will spread over the surface of the beet down into the root. And so this form of the disease actually isn't quite as common as much today as it was in previous years, because a major cause of the disease was actually cultivation, which would throw soil particles up into the crown. And since cultivation is no longer a major practice in the growing area, it's a lot less common now than it used to be. So in another major form of the disease that I'll be talking about today is root rot. And so the root rot infections often begin at the tip of the sugar beet root or anywhere along the root for that matter. And what you'll see is black or dark brown spots that form on the surface of the root. They often be circular or, or oval in shape, and they often appear as like a, in a, like a ladder pattern on the, on the sugar beet root. Now this is a very dry rot, and also it's a very shallow rot. So if you look at a cross section of an infected sugar beet, like the picture I have in the bottom of the screen, you'll see that the infection really doesn't penetrate that far into the sugar beet root as some of our other infections might. And so you'll also notice that there's a very clear line between infected tissue and healthy tissue, which is another important uh, symptom of, the, of this disease. So eventually, if the infection is severe enough, you can observe cracking in the root, and it's also possible to observe brown hyphae growing on, on the root. And so with this uh, root disease, it's possible that this can occur at the same time as some of the other uh, root diseases that we have. And oftentimes when you have a combination infection, that can be more severe than just one by itself. But that also makes it a little bit uh, more difficult to identify as the symptoms are a little bit less obvious when you have uh, multiple pathogens going on at once. So with these different forms of the disease, you'll often see uh, foliar symptoms associated with them. So these will start with the petioles darkening, starting at the base and moving out towards the end of the petiole. As you can see, some of the petioles in this picture are like that. Then eventually what you'll see is very severe wilting, which actually looks like a complete uh, collapse of the canopy. That's, and that is a uh, very sudden and permanent wilting. And the leaves will lay flat on the ground. And so that's actually another key characteristic of this disease as opposed to some of our other root diseases. Because with a lot of the other root diseases that we have, leaves will droop or maybe be like in, a, in an arch shape. And they'll often, during the heat of the day, droop like that. But then in the evening or in the mornings, they'll perk up and then they'll droop again and then perk back up and so on until the beet eventually dies. With rhizoctonia, however, once that can't be collapses, it'll stay flat against the soil. And eventually the leaves will end up dying, but they will remain attached to the plant, as you can see in the picture on the screen here. So now I want to take a brief moment to talk about the epidemiology of rhizoctony root and crown rot. And so this pathogen overwinters as hyphae in the soil. And in the spring and summer, infection is favored by wet but not flooded soil and by warmer temperatures. And so the optimal temperature range is from 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, although the infection can occur at a lower temperature than that. And so what you'll often see with this disease is you'll see spread go down the row. So in the picture I have on the screen here, you can see in almost an entire row of sugar beets that are damaged by this disease. And probably what happened here is that the center one was the first to get infected, and then it spread to its neighbor, and then to the next neighbor, and so on and so forth. Then also, this disease tends to be very patchy in fields. So you can see big patches of, of the disease, then large areas that aren't infected, and then other patches that are. And so this disease, unfortunately, has a very wide host range. So it can infect many of, our, of the crops that we grow here in Michigan, including sugar beets, corn, soybeans, and dry beans. And it also can infect several weed species, including pigweed and lamb's quarter. Then also, this disease can uh, survive on dead plant tissue, so it doesn't even really need the presence of a live host to continue. And so that can make management uh, somewhat difficult. So as you can imagine, we can get very severe uh, yield losses due to this disease. And in fact, under the worst case scenario, losses of greater than 50% are possible. But generally, losses from zero to three tons are more common, perhaps a percent of uh, sugar as well. And so the impact of the disease comes in several different ways, including a decrease in stand, a decrease in tons per acre, a decrease in sugar beet quality and sugar content, 
then also an increase in storage losses. So several years ago, Sugarbeet Advancement, under the direction of Steve Poindexter and Tom Wenzel, actually, actually did a very interesting study looking at the impact of rhizotonia on sugar beet quality. So what they did was they had several different uh, batches of, of sugar beets that they tested for, for sugar. And they had 10 beets in each batch. And the first one, they had 10 healthy beets. Then the next one, they had one that was infected by rhizotonia. Then the next batch, they had two that were infected by rhizotonia, and so on. And what they found was actually a very strong relationship between uh, recoverable white sugar per ton and, and the amount of rhizotonia in the sample. And what they found was that adding one infected sugar beet would lower the, the RWST by about 15 pounds, which is a very significant loss to the grower. So thankfully, there are several management uh, strategies that we have to help control this disease. And the first group includes cultural practices. So this includes doing things such as encouraging plant health by having a good fertility program, by planting early to uh, have the beets in before the temperatures get to the optimal range for the disease, and also doing things to improve soil health, particularly reducing compaction. Then also having good soil drainage is important because having wet soils encourages the disease. Then it's also important to not cultivate because again, cultivation can throw soil particles up into the crown of the sugar beet. Oh, that's not really a common practice anymore. So that's not really a major issue these days. Then with this disease, unlike a lot of the diseases that we deal with here in Michigan, rotation actually doesn't provide that much help for it because there is such a wide host range and it's such a good sapper fight really rotation doesn't really do all that much for it. With that being said though, if you have a, a greater than a three year rotation, that can help prevent the levels from building up to a, to a really very high level. And then also we do generally observe greater damage when beets follow soybeans, because soybeans are a particularly good host for, for rhizotonia. So another important cultural practice that we can do is to dig heavily infected fields during the early dig. And that really has a twofold impact as far as managing the disease. First, it prevents any further damage from occurring in that sugar beet field, so it can help you uh, save some losses there. But then also, it prevents those infected beets from going into storage, because when they are put into storage, they can cause rotting in the piles. And so really, for, for those two reasons, it's important to dig such infected fields in that, that early dig time frame. So another strategy that we have for managing this disease is variety selection. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the most important steps that a grower can take to manage the disease. So these days we have some varieties that are very resistant to rhizoctonia, and there are major differences between the varieties in the level of resistance. And so both Michigan Sugar and Sugar Beet Advancement do very, very good uh, work looking at this. And that, those results are published in the REACH Variety Child book every fall as well as discussed at the Seed Week meetings. So I would encourage everyone to check out that information from both those sources. So here on the screen I have, and I apologize for anyone who's uh, on the phone today, but on the screen I have a picture of uh, comparing a susceptible variety of sugar beet with a resistant variety of sugar beet. You can see that in our susceptible variety, we have a fairly large patch of rhizotony that's formed, but in the resistant variety, there isn't that patch and it stops abruptly when we change varieties. So really that kind of goes to show just how important variety selection can be for managing this disease. All right, so then the, the third uh, group of management strategies for rhizotonia is the application of fungicides. So one of the most effective fungicides that we have for rhizotonia are the azoxystrobins, particularly quadrus. So generally in areas that, have, that are known to have a lot of rhizotonia pressure, two applications of quadrus are very common. The first is an in-furrow application, which occurs at planting and in a two to four inch T-band. Then the second application is a foliar application done at the six to 10 leaf stage. And that one is also a banded application. So with the in-furrow application, that can be tank mixed with Mustang Max for some added insect protection particularly if you're planting into a, a wheat field. And then also uh, the rates for these applications should be adjusted based on the bandwidth and on the row spacing. 
and I couldn't really cover all that today. But if you have questions about that, I would encourage you to contact either myself, your local Michigan Sugar Field Consultant, or the Michigan Sugar Grower Guide. So there are, there are also several seed treatments that are available for rhizoctonia. And currently all of the seed companies apply a standard rhizoctonia seed treatment uh, to their seed. And as a standalone thing, uh, the seed treatments provide a slight reduction to the seedling disease, but they really shouldn't be viewed as a standalone management strategy for the entire season. So it's important to uh, include some of the other management practices that, that we discussed, particularly in quadrants. So I also want to mention that there are several generic brands of quadrants that are now available. And one that's particularly popular is, is uh, Asteroid. And so Asteroid is gaining particular attention because it has improved tank mixing ability with fertilizer as compared to Quadras. So last year, Sugar Bee Advancement actually did several different trials looking at having the Inferro Asteroid with a pop-up fertilizer. We actually had four locations of this. And what we saw there is that um, the Asteroid appears to be just as effective as Quadras at controlling Rhizoctonia. But we in our trials, we really didn't see a significant benefit from adding that pop-up fertilizer in. So if you want to give this a try, I would say, go ahead. You're probably not going to damage your sugar beets any. But I don't know if you're really going to gain all that much from adding the pop-up fertilizer. So another research uh, trial that we did last year looking at Isaac Tony management was done with Vandenboom Farms. And that one was done looking at kind of an, an all-around management strategy, including uh, variety selection and the number of quadrus applications. And so really this trial was inspired from some work that we did in 2019, where we uh, tried a couple of different products looking to manage Rhizoctonia, but we actually didn't get enough disease to really see any, any impact from those, from those products. And so we were kind of wondering if potentially we have enough resistance in our current varieties these days that we could potentially cut back on the number of Quadras applications. And so in this trial, we had two different varieties, including the resistant beta 1606, and the susceptible CX 1278. So then for each of those varieties, we had four different quadrus treatments, including one that had that was a check with zero applications, then one that was an inferral only treatment, and one that was a foliar only treatment, and the last that had both the inferral and the foliar. And in this particular field, we had a very high level of rhizoctonia pressure. And so it was really a very good trial to get a, a look at these different management strategies. So for the results, the two big things that we're looking at here are the deadbeat count and then the yield impact. And so in terms of the deadbeat count, what we saw was that in our top statistical grouping, we had the resistant variety with any of the rhizoctonia or any of the quadrus treatments. None of those were significantly different from each other. But then in the susceptible, I want to point out that we did see a significant difference in the number of dead beets between having both applications or any of the other treatments. So in, if you're going to be growing a susceptible variety, it's important to have both applications of quadrus yet. So then in terms of yield, we saw that in our top uh, statistical grouping was the, the resistant variety with at least one application of quadrus. So at this trial, as I mentioned, we did see a very high level of rhizoctonia present. And so the picture on the left is a photograph of our uh, resistant variety with both applications. And the right is the susceptible with no applications. And you can see that there's a, a very strong visible difference between those, those treatments. So I'm going to take just a moment to look further at the yield impact. And I actually gave the mean separation for those different treatments. And our top grouping was the resistant variety with at least one application of quadrus, followed by then the resistant variety with no quadrus applied. Then after that was the susceptible with both applications. Then the next grouping down was the susceptible with at least one application, and both those were not significantly different from each other. Then the final grouping was the susceptible with no quadrus applied. And so really there's three main takeaways that I think we can gain from this trial. The first is that in this case, the biggest thing that we could do for managing rhizoctonia was to plant that resistant variety. The second is that if you look in our resistant variety, you can see that um, 
there was no significant difference between any of the treatments that had at least one quadrus application. So that to me indicates that even in this very high pressure situation, probably just the one quadrus application would be enough to manage the disease. But at that same time, it's important to note that the one quadrus application still is important because those were significantly improved as far as yield goes compared to having no quadrus applications. And the final takeaway is that if you're going to be growing a susceptible variety, it's important to have both applications of quadrus yet because that treatment was significantly better than the rest of the, of the uh, quadrus application treatments in that susceptible variety. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge all the members of REACH who do sugar beet research here in Michigan, including Michigan Sugar, USDA, Michigan State University, the University of Guelph, and Sugar Beet Advancement. And I'd also like to give a special thank you to our grower cooperators who help us do our research. Without you volunteering your fields, your time, and your effort, there's no way that our work would be possible. So thank you all for that. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Daniel, I have a question concerning the, the temperature for Rhizoctonia to be very active. And uh, some of this is tied to as a soil-borne disease and soil temperature. If you have a, a very good canopy and good canopy closure, will you reduce the temperature enough where you may reduce that level of disease severity in the sugar beet field? Or is that not the case? So by the time that you would be getting canopy closure, the soil temperatures would be warm enough that that wouldn't be the case. Okay, all right. Are there any other questions in the chat or are there any questions for any of our specialists this morning? I know that we have several that are on. Uh, I do have a question for Dennis Pennington uh, on wheat and that is, um, have you seen any particular challenges in wheat fields across the area? Is he on? Is Dennis still on? Yeah, good morning, Phil. Yeah, as far as uh, wheat, uh, our crop overall looks really good. You can find some problem fields here and there, and um, people call me when they have a problem, so I see all of those. Uh, but with this Yield Enhancement Network project I've got, um, I've been traveling to wheat fields all over the state of Michigan, and the growers that are working with me on that are telling me that this is the best looking wheat crop they've seen in many, many years. So um, we'll see what the weather brings and, and whatnot between here and, and harvest. You know, we'd, we'd like to keep this cooler temperature. The wheat does real well in these cooler temperatures. Um, so hopefully we don't have 90 plus degree days during grain fill period. But so far our wheat crop is looking really good and we're off to a good start. Okay, we have one more question that came into the chat and this would be for Daniel. And uh, there's a question about row spacing and the influence on rhizoctonia. Can you address that, Daniel? Sure. So generally we found that row spacing really doesn't have that much of an impact on, on rhizoctonia. That's, it can have an impact for some other diseases, but in this case, it's not really that much of an issue, so. So what kind of diseases where you, would you see an impact because of row spacing and beets? Um, well, good question. It is a good question. <laughs> So one area where you might see it is with uh, potentially some of your leaf spots that could influence the canopy closure and the humidity within the canopy potentially, but even that would be a fairly small impact. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. So any other questions this morning? We have several of our other specialists on uh, that can answer questions. And does anyone have a report on whether or not they have seen any type of frost damage on anything that has emerged. I know there are some soybeans that have emerged and other crops. Uh, any type of frost damage that you saw, uh, particularly in the northern parts of Michigan, has anyone seen anything? 
Phil, this is Mike. I, I got a report from one of our cooperators up in the Bay County area. He planted in March, his soybeans in March. They were up certainly before that freeze event. And uh, he just reports that they look beautiful. They're just, they made it through that freeze event, uh, even though there was nighttime temperatures as low as 26 to 28 degrees. Um, he said it was breezy all night, Jeff, so I don't know if that helped or not. But um, he said, the, by and large, the less than 10% injury or damage. The stand looks really good. Planted in March. So I think we've got a question for Chris and Jeff both and has to do with uh, migrant insects coming into Michigan over the weekend. Any chances of that happening? Chris, I'll let you, you take, but there was definitely, uh, there was a, a transport event here this weekend and not just Michigan, but much of uh, the upper Midwest with really strong southerly and southwesterly winds. It didn't last that long, but it was certainly enough. Uh, some cases, 40 per mile per hour winds here mostly in southern uh, portions of the state, but uh, that, that would, would peaked on Saturday. So I don't know, certainly the meteorology was there, but, I, but I'll let you follow up with, with regard to any observations of what may have fallen out. So my, uh, my traps are checked on Thursday, which would be today, and I haven't checked them yet. Last Thursday, I did get, uh, and I have a, as an entomologist, these are always on my desk. This is a cup of the black cutworms that I caught, but I, ha I didn't have any true armyworm in, in my traps yet. But I would suspect today when I go out and check them then, based on what you're saying, that I might uh, pick, pick them up. I know Paul and Monica are both trapping up to in the central part of the state, and Ricardo and Eric have the bottom tier. Uh, so they, they may have caught something that I didn't if they can speak up. I checked mine on Wednesday, Chris, and yesterday I had my army worm are really low. The most uh, most I had in one trap was four. I got three army worm out, but my black cup worm took a spike. Uh, okay. Highest was uh, 24. Uh, another trap was double digit, and the other was single digit. So I caught more black cup worm last week as well. So, so I forgot to check the... Uh the Great Lakes map this this morning, but there weren't a lot of traps in there. It was Michigan and then some areas in Ontario. So um, without so many traps, it's hard to tell. Uh, I don't know if Eric is on. He's right at that southern, trapping it right at the southern border there. Eric is not on today, Chris. Okay. So, so I, I do have a question in regards to migrant insects like potato leafhopper. Are these temperatures cold enough where we're going to we're going to kill these insects if we get into the mid twenties. No, no, no. Okay. No, I mean, uh, they, wishful they, thinking. you all, all you guys think that all these things are going to die. They're not going to die. So something, somebody asked me yesterday about alfalfa weevil. Well, why aren't they dying? It's like, well, they overwintered already. They already overwintered and they come out and, you know, they don't hang up at the top of the plant as they're to, you know, to be frosted. They climb down and they get near the root and, you know, they, or they go under some residue and, you know, yeah, if you had a whole week of really, really cold temperatures and even during the day, it never warmed up, but, you know, one of those mornings where it was at my house, it was 28 or something like that. You know, by the time the sun came up, it warmed up to, you know, 45, 50 during the day. So, you know, they're like, okay. So something like leafhopper is being transported, uh, you know, and it's way up there in the air and it's probably cold up there. And then it's getting rained out. I, I, um, I should check and see if there's leafhopper. It wouldn't, uh, it's a little early. Our average date of arrival is uh, May 20th. I looked that up and that's about the average date. So we'd be a little bit early, but if there's, if there's a strong event, strong wind event, they, they can certainly come a little bit earlier. Okay. Uh, Jeff, there's a question, Dennis has a question about the wind forecast for those that need to spray. Uh, what's the prognosis, doctor? Well, today actually will probably, not much, but of course we've got to, we've got to, dodge showers and, and some, some light rain. It is going to be uh, similar to the last couple of days tomorrow and into Saturday, unfortunately, during the daytime, probably be looking at 15, at least maybe 20 mile per hour winds. Greatest will be during the, from the late morning into the uh, late afternoon. And there will be some reduction then evening and overnight, but but we, we will have winds to deal with probably until the late weekend. It, it, pro it should be better by Sunday and early next week, but the windiest days right now look like uh, tomorrow 
and Saturday, especially during the daytime. All right. If I don't see any more questions in the chat and uh, people are starting to uh, think about getting other things done for today. So with that, I'm going to end today's virtual breakfast and I'd like to thank each and every person that joined us, as well as our specialist, especially, uh, especially Daniel Bublitz and Jeff Andresen, who have done a great job with their presentations and providing us with some great information. So as we'll see you next week with Dr. Aaron Burns. And in the meantime, be safe and have a great week. Thanks, everyone.